Shall we start? In the name of God, the compassionate, the merciful, uh, I'm very happy to be here with you and I pray that our session together would be beneficial for all of us and would help us reach better understanding and a stronger respect and love for each other. Uh, I would say a little bit about <clears throat> my background and about uh, what we are going to discuss, but then before we start actually the discussion, I would like to uh, listen to everyone and if they want to introduce themselves, they work their expectations. So I am Muhammad Ali Shomali. <coughs> Sorry. I was born in Tehran in Iran. And when I was a teenager, I had many questions about religion and about other subjects. And in our family, we didn't have any religious scholar. Uh, so for me, I had to ask teachers, I had to read lots of books, so I had I spent maybe 90% of my pocket money in you know, buying books and reading, but I was not convinced. So finally I decided to go to Qom, where we have the uh, largest you know, seminary for the uh, Shia Muslim, but perhaps for all Muslims we have some 70,000 Iranian students and more than 10,000 international students. So I thought I have to do my best to find the answer. So I said I have to move there. Uh, so I had to please my parents and seek permission from them. I had to leave my high school, which was for talented students, and everyone goes you know, to medicine or engineering. And I said, no, I want to go to religious studies. Uh, so I went to Com, and then um, I focused uh, on two aspects because we have a very long process of learning in seminary you know I don't know if you are familiar with the Shiite seminaries you know for us it's uh, if you want to be a reasonable scholar 15 20 years of a study so three four years is you know to warm up so, <laughs> so it's matter so I went there and I started you know studying different subjects but from the beginning I had this understanding that I can find satisfaction in my studies when I follow the intellectual and spiritual lines together. So I worked on philosophy, but also on spirituality. After seven years of study in seminary, I also thought I should do Western philosophy. At that time in Qom, we didn't have degrees on Western philosophy. We had people who studied, but no degree. So I had to uh, register in Tehran University, Department of Philosophy. And I used to commute, although I'm from Tehran, but I had moved to Qom. So I managed to get my BA in Western philosophy and then MA in Western philosophy, but aligned with my Islamic studies. Then in 96, I was given a scholarship to do my PhD. Uh, so I chose to do PhD in Manchester on ethical relativism, but uh, my study is not, uh, you know, Islamic as such. It's philosophical. So if you read without my name, you don't understand Muslim or not, because I think the language of philosophy is a good common language that we all can use. And then I did my postdoc on bioethics. Then I went back to Qom 2001. And I was the part, head of the Department of Religions at Imam Khomeini Institute, which had sponsored my PhD. But since my stay in Manchester, at the same time that I was asked also to be Imam of the Shia community in Manchester, I used the opportunity to know as much as possible about Christianity because I thought it's a golden opportunity. We had studied Christianity, but we didn't have any Christian you know, people in Qom. So I wanted to know more about Christianity. So we spent lots of time with my wife. Uh, sometimes, you know, one week we stayed in monastery 
for example, there is a Benedictine monastery in Amperforth. Uh, many times, you know, sometimes up to one week, sometimes three days, sometimes, you know, uh, they ask me to give lectures, you know, in 2000, 2001, I used to go and give lecture, stay and, you know, overnight and then come back. So we uh, spend lots of time with different groups of Christians, then it reached to other countries, Italy and other places. So in 2001, when I was going back to Iran, I invited one of the monks who had PhD in theology. He was a, a young theologian, but he's also a Benedictine monk. And I told him, if you like, you know, you can visit us in seminary in Coma. I'm going back, you know, home. He said I should seek permission from the abbot. So he talked to the abbot, and abbot said, I also like to come. So mm -hmm. both of them visited us in 2002. And we had lots of uh, discussions there. We advertised in the whole city of Qom, you know, that we have these two young, you know, and uh, old monks, you know, to talk. And many people came. We had very good sessions. And then when we were in the car, and I don't, uh, you know, forget. Sometimes I say, you start with little things, but uh, you don't know the significance. So in the car, just going back to Tehran, we had a discussion what would be the next step. Uh, so we thought it's good to have a dialogue in the UK. And they suggested to have the dialogue in their monastery, which is in Ampleforth, North Yorkshire. It's about four hours, you know, drive from London. And I thought it's very good because I find uh, monastery very peaceful and spiritual. But uh, most of our people, uh, Shia community, are not in that area. They're in London. So they said, now we go back to the UK and look for a partner in London. So they approached Heathrow College. I don't know if you heard Heathrow College is run by Jesuits. It's part of University of London, but unfortunately they're closing down now for financial reasons. Uh, so, uh, you know, Benedictines and Jesuits didn't have very good relation in the past. But uh, sometimes, you know, I say, you know, this dialogue with Islam that brings even uh, people <laughs> together <laughs> as it can do for us also. So, in July 2003, we had the first uh, round of Catholic Shia dialogue in UK which was considered by the tablet. I don't know if you are familiar with tablet. It's for the Catholic, you know, uh, English you know, speakers. So they said this is the first major British encounter of the Catholic theologians with the Iranian Shia thinkers and theologians. So we kept continuing. <clears throat> now we have had so far eight rounds of dialogue. We have published six volumes. But these are major ones. So the very last one was in September, first week of September in Nairobi. We had abbot primate of the whole Benedictine uh, community. With the previous abbot primate, we had people from different countries. But on the side, we have developed lots of other friendship. Uh, so maybe so far we have had, I can say, you know, easily 50, 60 you know, a small also meetings and conferences and dialogue with the Catholics only, but also with the Lutheran, with the Anglicans, with the Mennonites. So at the same time that I have been going to these dialogues with my mind and heart, I was trying also to understand better what's really the plan of God for us as human beings and what God wanted to tell us which maybe we have not understood. So I've been always also thinking. So we try to mix between, again, the same thing I said that I had in the mind, heart and mind. Because I think if you just go with heart or just with mind would not be enough. You have to go with both of them. So thanks to God, we have made uh, lots of good contacts, friendship, Friendship, which are some of them for 20 years, some of them for 50 years. I never, you know, lose my friends. I try to keep in touch. We started a program in Com to train uh, clerics who can be 
active in interfaith, intra-faith activities, building bridges. And we have some of them now in US, in Canada, in UK, in Austria, in other places. And a very important project that uh, I am very grateful to God for that project it started about two years ago. So I don't know if you are familiar with uh, Sofia University. This is for the Focolare movement. And this is a group of you know Catholics, the largest lay movement in the Catholic Church, but they have also non Catholic Christians. And in Algeria only, of course, they have also Muslim members uh, mm -hmm. because there are not that many Christians there. So we have had lots of visits. So about two years ago, I suggested to the president, and this is a historical, you know, uh, turning point for our relation. They had invited me to teach the graduate students about Islam and interfaith dialogue. Then after that, I had a meeting with the president, and I said, his name is Piero. I said, Piero, I think God has a plan for unity. And he also has the same understanding. But I said, it seems to me we are somehow stuck in this, you know, fast changing world in which we are, you know, uh, faced with many challenges. It seems we are stuck. We are not making that much progress in this journey towards unity. But on the other hand, I am totally convinced that if we try our best, God would guide us. Because the Quran tells us, Those who really struggle in our way, we would certainly guide them. So I said, I am sure that God would really guide us if we can demonstrate to God that we are really seeking guidance. Not that, you know, I have my normal life, I'm relaxed and say, you know, God, you can guide me. No, I have to show to God that I am really thirsty for understanding. But, so far it's not new. But something that was new, perhaps, at least for me was new. I said, Piero, I think I cannot say to God that I have done my best for understanding your plan if I only talk to my Muslim brothers and sisters, and I only use Muslim literature, and I only reflect on the Quran. I have also to talk to you and discuss with you and benefit from your wisdom and your experiences, and perhaps you the same. You also cannot say to God you did your best without consulting Muslims. So if we together sit and think and ask God, please guide us, without also putting any condition. God, please guide us, but through me. I should be the one who says to others, what's your plan? This is a big mistake. We have to be humble. We should not say, because I'm Muslim, God, tell me first, and then I will tell other people. We should empty ourselves from ego and let God choose to whom he wants to suggest his idea. He welcomed and he said, this is a very good project. We can start this project. And he asked me, what should we call it? So I didn't think about a name because I was not sure whether he would accept it or not. Just came to my mind, Wings of Unity. And he welcomed it. And, you know, because I thought Islam and Christianity are two wings. Mm -hmm. And for unity, we need them to fly together. And he welcomed it. That was interesting. Actually, his surname is Coda. And Coda in Italian means tail. For bird, the tail. So I said, okay, we have wings and tail. Now we can, you know, <laughs> fly. So we planned to meet every few months and discuss, take notes for ourselves, and see how it goes. Thanks to God, it went very, very well. So in the first round... For example, I had three lectures. Uh, like this, these are my three lectures I gave in the first round. Uh, this was uh, about one and a half year ago. And I myself keep using these discussions. It opened for me new horizons. And then we had second, third, fourth. So, so far we have had fourth round of dialogue. 
but it's not dialogue, it's thinking together, not just talk. We know already uh, each other for many years. And one of the beautiful things we did, we designed a summer course for 20 Christian and 20 Shia youths in northern Italy, in Trent. So last July, sorry, last August, last week of August, just before going to Kenya, I, I had to go there. We had 23 Shia youths, 20 Catholic youths. For one week, we went together with the Christian and you know Muslim scholars, and we shared with them our ideas. And thanks to God, it went very well. And although we had worked hard for about 20 years to reach that level of unity, but these youths very easily accepted it. And this is why I say you can spend 20 years making a lake, but then you can make it available for other people and they can just, you know, dive into the lake. It doesn't need youths to spend 20 years like us if we prepare for them the ground. And what was very interesting is these are Christians who are practicing and these are Muslims who are practicing, but they could unite. <clears throat> because some people think people who are not serious about religion can better, you know, interact. When religion becomes important for you, then that's conflict. Actually, we tested the opposite. These are practicing Christians and practicing Muslims who built unity and even they found the presence of the other group very helpful. Because in my understanding, if my relation with God is the way that God wants, I should find presence of people from other faiths helpful, not just something that I tolerate. If I am a man of God and I am in the mosque or in a church and I see people of other faith, I should not feel these are troublemakers. I should feel this would enrich my relation with God. I should feel that God is more present because this is something enlarging my heart. We had a moment on the top of mountain. There is a you know mountain there, Dolomites. And we went there with the youths to climb the mountain. Some of the youths, and I was at that time sitting with some people, some of the youths they, themselves automatically <coughs> on the you know, edge of the cliff, they sat and they started prayer. And other youths joined them. So these are Muslim youths, Christian youths, praying on mountain. And afterwards they told us that was one of the best moments of the trip. And some of them said that, of, that was one of the most tranquil moments of their life. One of the Shia youths in, from Montreal said, I pray to God that I want to die with the same tranquility. So these are the things that we are you know, now thinking and testing and trying to understand how we can make people sure that they can have their faith, they can be very committed to their faith, but there is no need to be worrying about relation with people of other faiths. Actually, this should enrich their faith. So this is what we want to talk, you know, but as I said, I would like to hear to you and, you know, your experiences, your expectations, and then we can talk about um, identity and what would be the role of religion in our identity and how today we can help people with developing a sense of identity which would suit a world which is multi-faith, multicultural. So if we can maybe start from here. Okay. I'm um, Saro Masala Nejad. I am um, from Iran, and but uh, I was a PhD student here in Sweden. And uh, But uh, I'm a beginner. I, I try to um, cooperate in this workshop and learn. Thank you. So mm. do you study also now? Or you no, I finished. You finished. But I'm, I'm in my postdoc. Postdoc. Yeah. What's your subject? Uh, in physiotherapy. Physiotherapy. I'm working with elderly people. Very good. Very good. <laughs> yes. Uh, I'm uh, Jörn Hansson. <laughs> I'm a priest in the Church of Sweden. And I've been priest here in Sollentuna for 29 years.